Chapter One. No," said Jackson with a shy little smile. "I'm sorry, I won't play hide and seek." It was Christmas Eve, and there were fourteen of us in the house. We had had a good dinner, and we were all in the mood for fun and games. All that is, except Jackson. When somebody suggested hide and seek, there were loud shouts of agreement. Jackson's refusal was the only one. It was not like Jackson to refuse to play a game. Aren't you feeling well? Someone asked. I'm perfectly all right, thank you," he said. But he added with a smile that softened his refusal but did not change it, "I'm still not playing hide and seek." Why not? Someone asked. He hesitated for a moment before replying. I sometimes go and stay at a house where a girl was killed. She was playing hide and seek in the dark. She didn't know the house very well. There was a door that led to the servants' staircase. When she was chased, she thought the door led to a bedroom. She opened the door, and jumped, and landed at the bottom of the stairs. She broke her neck, of course. We all looked serious. Mrs. Fernley said, "How terrible! And were you there when it happened?" Jackson shook his head sadly. "No," he said. But I was there when something else happened. Something worse. What could be worse than that? This was," said Jackson. He hesitated for a moment. Then he said, "I wonder if any of you have ever played a game called Smee. It's much better than hide and seek. The name comes from 'It's Me,' of course. Perhaps you'd like to play it instead of hide and seek." Let me tell you the rules of the game. Every player is given a sheet of paper. All the sheets except one are blank. On the last sheet of paper is written Smee. Nobody knows who Smee is except Smee himself or herself. You turn out the lights, and Smee goes quietly out of the room and hides. After a time, the others go off to search for Smee. But of course, they don't know who they are looking for. When one player meets another, he challenges him by saying "Smee." The other player answers "Smee," and they continue searching. But the real Smee doesn't answer when someone challenges. The second player stays quietly beside him. Presently, they will be discovered by a third player. He will challenge and receive no answer, and he will join the first two. This goes on until all the players are in the same place. The last one to find Smee has to pay a forfeit. It's a good, noisy, amusing game. In a big house, it often takes a long time for everyone to find Smee. Perhaps you'd like to try. I'll happily pay my forfeit and sit here by the fire while you play. It sounds a good game, I remarked. Have you played it too, Jackson? Yes, he answered. I played it in the house that I was telling you about. And she was there, the girl who broke. I know that there were thirteen of us playing the game, and there were only twelve people in the house. And I didn't know the dead girl's name. His words didn't make sense at all. Tim Vouse was the kindest man in the world. He smiled at us all. Chapter Two. Have you met the Sangstons? They're cousins of mine, and they live in Surrey. Five years ago, they invited me to go and spend Christmas with them. It was an old house with lots of unnecessary passages and staircases. A stranger could get lost in it quite easily. Well, I went down for that Christmas. Violet Sangston promised me that I knew most of the other guests. Unfortunately, I couldn't get away from my job until Christmas Eve. All the other guests had arrived there the previous day. I was the last to arrive, and I was only just in time for dinner. I said hello to everyone I knew, 
and Violet Sangston introduced me to the people I didn't know. Then it was time to go into dinner. That is perhaps why I didn't hear the name of a tall, dark-haired, handsome girl whom I hadn't met before. Everyone was in rather a hurry, and I am always bad at catching people's names. She looked cold and clever. She didn't look at all friendly, but she looked interesting. And I wondered who she was. A girl really did break her neck on those stairs. I asked how it happened. It was about ten years ago, before we came here. There was a party, and they were playing hide-and-seek. This girl was looking for somewhere to hide. She heard somebody coming and ran along the passage to get away. She opened the door, thinking it led to a bedroom. She planned to hide in there until the seeker had gone. Unfortunately, it was the door that led to the back stairs. She fell straight down to the bottom of the stairs. She was dead when they picked her up. We all promised to be careful. Mrs. Gorman even made a little joke about living to be ninety. You see, none of us had known the poor girl, and we didn't want to feel sad on Christmas Eve. Well, we all started the game immediately after dinner. After a time, I found a group of people all sitting on some narrow stairs. I challenged and received no answer. So, Smee was there. I hurriedly joined the group. Presently, two more players arrived. Each one was hurrying to avoid being last. Jack Sangston was last and was given a forfeit. I think we're all here now, aren't we? he remarked. He lit a match, looked up the staircase, and began to count. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, he said, and then laughed. <laughs> That's silly. There's one too many. The match went out, and he lit another and began to count. He got as far as twelve. Then he looked puzzled. There are thirteen people here, he said. I haven't counted myself yet. Oh, nonsense, I laughed. You probably began with yourself, and now you want to count yourself twice. His son took out his electric torch. Chapter 3 This time, I was Smee. Violet Sangston found me while I was searching for a hiding place. That game didn't last long. Soon there were twelve people and the game was over. Violet felt cold and wanted her jacket. Her husband went up to their bedroom to fetch it. You were Smee last time, weren't you? Well, of course, I didn't know who Smee was. While Mother and the others ran to the west side of the house and found you, I went east. There's a deep clothes cupboard in my bedroom. It looked like a good hiding place. So I turned on my electric torch, and there was nobody there. Now, I am sure I touched a hand, and nobody could get out of the cupboard because I was standing in the doorway. What do you think? You imagine that you touched a hand, I said. Chapter 4 Perhaps it was my imagination, although I'm almost sure that it wasn't, but I had a feeling that nobody was really enjoying the game any more. But everyone was too polite to mention it. All the same, I had the feeling that something was wrong. All the fun had gone out of the game. Something deep inside me was trying to warn me. Take care, it whispered. Take care. But it seemed to me that most of us were just acting. We were no longer enjoying the game. At first I stayed with the others, but for several minutes no Smee was found. I left the main group and started searching on the first floor at the west side of the house. Somebody was sitting in a corner of one of the window seats behind a curtain. Aha, I thought, I've caught Smee. So I pulled the curtain to one side and touched a woman's arm. 
It was a dark, moonless night outside. I couldn't see the woman sitting in the corner of the window seat. Chapter 5 I did not know the name, but I guessed at once who she was. I knew every girl in the house by name, except one, and that was the tall, pale, dark girl. So, here she was, sitting beside me on the window seat, shut in between a heavy curtain and a window. I was beginning to enjoy the game. I wondered if she was enjoying it too. I whispered one or two rather ordinary questions to her and received no answer. Smee is a game of silence. It's a rule of the game that Smee and the person or persons who have found Smee have to keep quiet. This, of course, makes it harder for the others to find them. But there was nobody else about. I wondered, therefore, why she was insisting on silence. I spoke again and got no answer. I began to feel a little annoyed. Perhaps she is one of those cold, clever girls who have a poor opinion of all men, I thought. She doesn't like me, and she is using the rules of the game as an excuse for not speaking. She reached out across me. I heard her fingernails scratch a woman's silk dress. Hello, Smee. How are you? Who are you? Oh, is it against the rules to talk? Never mind, Tony, we'll break the rules. I hope they aren't going to play it all evening. I'd like to play a nice quiet game all together beside a warm fire. Me too, I agreed. Is Mrs. Gorman with you? Yes. What happened to you? You've both got forfeits. We've all been waiting for you for hours. But you haven't found Smee yet, I complained. You haven't, you mean? I was Smee this time. But Smee is here with us, I cried. Yes, agreed Mrs. Gorman. The curtain was pulled back, and we sat looking into the eye of Reggie's electric torch. I looked at Mrs. Gorman, and then on my other side. Between me and the wall was an empty place on the window seat. Chapter 6 We were not very popular when we came down to the sitting room. I found the two of them sitting behind a curtain on a window seat, said Reggie. I went up to the tall, dark girl. So you pretended to be Smee and then went away, I accused her. She shook her head. I could see that he was rather cross with me, and soon he told me the reason. Tony, he said, I suppose you are in love with Mrs. Gorman. That's your business, but please don't make love to her in my house during a game. You kept everyone waiting. She whispered her name to me. Of course, she refused to admit it afterwards. Jack Sangston stared at me. Miss who? he breathed. Brenda Ford, she said. Jack put a hand on my shoulder. Look here, Tony, he said. I don't mind a joke, but... Enough is enough. We don't want to worry the ladies. Brenda Ford is the name of the girl who broke her neck on the stairs. She was playing hide-and-seek here ten years ago. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.